Hey, what's up, everybody? Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Uh, today, we're going to talk about pastoral ministry and uh, the idea of being called into ministry. We're even going to look uh, a little bit at some things that we might want to consider if we're considering a new job. Maybe we want to move to a different congregation. Maybe we're considering a pastoral ministry call for the very first time. And so I brought with me today one of my good friends. This is Jared Nelson. Uh, he is another pastor in the PCA here with me. We are both situated in western Pennsylvania, just north of Pittsburgh, at least that's our position here. And we're in Ascension Presbytery together. So I brought on Jared Nelson. Jared, say hello to the folks at home and tell us a little bit about your church ministry over there at New Life. Uh, hello, my name is Jared Nelson. I'm to the northwest of Pittsburgh in a town called Hopewell Township um, near Aliquippa. So if you are ever on uh, 376 going north. Um, you'll come to exit 45, and uh, we're right there. I've been there for about eight years, so I'm I still feel new there, but apparently I've been there for eight years, so I guess I'm not all that new anymore. And so I've been in uh, the PCA for over a decade, and uh, been doing uh, was ordained just a little bit over a decade ago, and have had the experience a couple of times of going through um, the process of being called to a church and candidating at a church, and so. These are um, get some questions on that every now and then. And so um, I think you're uh, referring to it later, but wrote an article that was kind of along those lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So tell us about New Life. What time do you have worship services on the Lord's Day? And what are some of the programs that you guys have going on over there? Well, we meet at 11 o'clock for Sunday morning worship on Sundays. And then uh, 930, we have adult and kids Sunday school and uh, we'll do some things during the week uh, that are kind of off and on, men's and women's Bible studies, some uh, kids' catechism uh, work that's just been uh, started. So um, depending on the season of the year, we have different things that are going on. But 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings is when our main worship service is at. Now, what's the worship service like there? I see a bunch of stringed instruments on the back wall there. Before we started recording, I had to clarify whether that was a a zither or a lyre, or uh, I guess you said it was a dulcimer. So um, you you play those in church, or is that your own personal collection there? Well, that's partly my own personal collection. That's my uh, my grandpa's dulcimer, as well as a uh, mandolin that my uh, parents got me started on, and guitar. And uh, we'll have guitar and piano music that's there. Although we're uh, we try to play music that is um, our rules usually are singable and uh, theologically uh, accurate. And so um, sometimes you get really singable stuff, but you're like, there's there's no meat here. And um, if you have ever used the Trinity, you know there's some songs that are really great lyrics, but are not necessarily singable. So you try to get a, a mix of those. So it's a bit mixed in terms of the instruments that are used, but you know, I, I think I, I have good reason to sometimes use a guitar since um, David used a lyre and yeah. you know, Psalm actually means to pluck. So mm -hmm. um, even if we're singing a psalm, it's good to uh, maybe have some plucked accompanying with that. That's awesome. Well, hey, again, if you're just checking in, my name is Matthew Everhard, pastor of Gospel Fellowship Presbyterian Church. Uh, we worship at 8.30 and 11 on the Lord's Day. We'd love for you to come check us out sometime. You can just Google our name, Gospel Fellowship PCA, on the interwebs, and uh, we'd love to connect with you. If you do happen to stop in sometime, please come up, shake my hand, say hello. We'd be very glad to uh, to greet you by name, and thank you very much for coming. Well, our topic today has to do with finding a pastoral job. Uh, for some of us, I suppose, we consider it a job and that we gain a paycheck from um, working for the church. It's a delightful calling. It's the best job in the world as far as I'm concerned. But sometimes people who have not yet had a pastoral call, they kind of wonder what the searching process is like to try to find a church. And some people are transitioning from a good, healthy relationship to an, a different relationship in the church, or maybe a bad um, professional experience in the pastoral ministry to hopefully a better one. And so today, uh, Jared and I are going to talk about how it is that we we find the right church and the right call if uh, if indeed pastoral vocation is our is our true calling. And so Jared wrote an article just the other day. He posted it on a website called PCAPolity.com, good website for those of us who are PCA insiders. And he posed there 10 questions that a, um, a potential pastoral candidate might consider asking before they accepted a call to that particular 
church. And so what we're going to do in this video is we're going to kind of go through Jared's article a little bit, but I thought I'd kind of back up the truck at the beginning of the conversation and just ask, ask you this, Jared. So if you are considering whether or not being a pastor is even the right thing for you, um, how would you know if you are indeed called to like a full-time vocational pastoral ministry as your job? Is that something that's uh, knowable? How do you figure that out? How did you figure that out? Well, there's, there's actually a lot that is involved with that. It's not as if you can open up the Bible and say, so-and-so is called to the ministry, but um, there's a lot of things that I think go into a call and there's similar things that go into when we're deciding on any sort of vocation that we go into, um, except a, a call to pastoral ministry would have to have with it both a, a desire for that position. Um, we're told in uh, First Timothy that to desire uh, the position of an overseer is a noble thing. So it's not something we should be ashamed of, or we have to have somebody else say, you have to do this. And we have to say no 14 times like Augustine did. Um, but um, it's something we do feel called towards. Um, now, another part of a call is the fact that you may feel like you want to do something or called to something, but um, other people haven't affirmed that. Um, mm -hmm. Some people um, have a real desire to sing, but other people don't have a desire to hear you sing. Um, <laughs> So we may have a passion for ministry, but if we aren't able to communicate or to teach or things like that, uh, we either need some training or we might not be actually called. So uh, internal calling is important. External calling is important. And then finally, uh, an opportunity. Um, so you may have people that affirm you should do something. You have a desire for it. But until you actually have uh, the opportunity, you don't finally have that call realized. Uh, so when those three things come into place, um, that's when that's when it, it seems like providence is, is moving you towards a, a call and it begins with you know a desire for it um, a desire to to serve the church in that way and to uh, to be called as uh, a shepherd in, in some sort of capacity pastor assistant pastor uh, for youth uh, whatever its particularities are so would you say in summary then it's sort of the internal subjective call of the feeling the desire to be in pastoral ministry confirmed by maybe the testimony of other people who validate that same gift within you and then that matching up with an actual opportunity a, a real church that calls you into that ministry it's not that we have ordained ministers that just kind of float around out there um although sometimes we have a minister without a call but um the idea is that a particular church would call you to be their pastor we have that right yeah, and I think it's I think some of those um, those three things were identified uh, by Oz Guinness and Tim Keller. I think has used those before, so uh, they're pretty um, standard that are out there of the internal, the external affirmation, and the the opportunity to serve. And when those things come together, and um, usually these these questions are coming on the third part of that: is there a church that's interested in you and calling you? And sometimes we rush into an opportunity to say, "Hey, there's a church that's available," but you do need to do your due diligence to say, is this actually what I'm called to, the position that I should be called to? And is this the church that um, would use those gifts uh, and not being called to? Um, I've, I've heard a few people say it like this, that if you can do anything else than be a pastor, you should probably do that thing because of the the high standards that we're called to in terms of being judged by God for, for how it is that we discharge our ministry. Do you think that's good advice that if you can do anything else, do that instead? Um, it probably depends what we mean by that, because if you can do something else, but you always feel this tug as if you were supposed to be doing this, then maybe something's wrong there. Um, but I actually had a friend that I went to seminary with that um, I asked him, you know, what's your dream job? And he said, IT. And I said, then you probably should be doing that and not be pursuing cemetery or seminary. Yeah. And um, so there's, you really need to have a draw that uh, what's going to keep you there when you realize that if you were doing something in the private sector, you may be uh, making some more uh, money and you're having a lot of time, time demands on you. So um, I think within reason, there's, there's a, there's a nugget of truth there. Uh, I think Spurgeon said that something along those lines to mm -hmm. his students that were wanting to become pastors. So it's, if Spurgeon said it, it can't be terrible advice. That's right. That's right. What do you think about um, um, if you so let's say you began to feel that you're called to ministry, but you're not sure about it being vocational or, or professional. Do you think that some people kind of make the mistake of 
tinkering with ministry um, when they should actually just probably be volunteering in their church, just finding a, a role, whether it's working with the youth or whether it's coordinating a committee? Do, do you think some people maybe think that they're called and that, but actually they should probably just volunteer more? <laughs> I think that's um, at least the place to start, because if you're exploring a call, you probably need to get involved in your local church and start doing the things that you were uh, feel that you want to do vocationally and full time uh, to see if you have an opportunity to teach. Or maybe there's a midweek service that you can have a, a preaching opportunity there that's not necessarily regular. Um, but to be able to exercise those gifts and have other people affirm yeah, that was, I, we do think you have some gifting. And if you had some training, you'd be able to hone that craft. Um, so that's at least the place to, to get started is to start to do those things uh, within the church. And uh, many times when you're looking for like a deacon and an elder, one of the things you look for is who's already doing those things. Right. Let's make them a deacon and an elder. Yeah. Uh, same thing to some degree with, with being a pastor. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Now let, let's jump ahead just a little bit and assume then that the calling is established and a person is quite sure that the Lord is directing them into pastoral ministry. And uh, so what do you do? You get online, you, you hit in like pastor jobs near me on google.jobs.com or something like that. And all of a sudden you're uh, you're hit with a, a wide panoply of, of ministry opportunities. Now, you and I, we're pretty connected to the PCA. So our search might be pretty specific to the PCA. Other people might not have a denominational affiliation or maybe one that they're not so secure with. So, Jared, do you think that there should be some absolutes that um, that are non-compromisable for us in terms of what kind of a church we ought we would we would we would want to serve versus some clear red flags that would be like, no way, I could not possibly serve in a church like that? Would you have kind of a rubric of like must and must nots if you were if you were searching for a job? Yeah, something that's interesting within the PCA is if you are ordained and or are seeking a call and it's someplace that's not within the PCA, they ask you, do you have liberty to preach and teach or are you going to be restricted? And I think that's one of the um, non-negotiables is, uh, am I limited in what I can do? Can, do I have to go against conscience that I can't do certain things? Like I'm in a place in which they say you cannot preach the gospel or don't don't you dare uh, preach from the Old Testament or something along those lines that um, you're limited in, in presenting the whole counsel of God. And everybody's going to have conscience or um, uh, issues that come up with particular calls. If you are a credo Baptist, you're not going to accept a call to one that baptizes infants because that would go against your conscience. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So uh, do they practice the sacraments in a way that you are comfortable taking those reins? Um, are you able to preach the gospel? And um, can you submit to whatever leadership there is there? Um, if there's an elder board, can you submit to the people that are there? Um, are they uh, godly men? Are they, are they biblical in terms of their government? Um, if you're looking at some place and it has a bishop and you answer to them, can you submit in that way? Is that or does that go against your conscience? So church yeah. government even plays a role in uh, what you would take and what you wouldn't. That is one advantage, I would say, to being in a denomination like the PCA, for instance. I realize not everybody out there is in the PCA or even a reformed denomination as such. But at least theoretically, we know what we believe when we go to a PCA church. You're going to find a church that, uh, while their worship style might manifest itself different slightly, or the order of the liturgy might be different, at least the PCA churches, we know that it's a church that subscribes to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So for those of us who are Reformed, we have kind of that built-in advantage that, again, at least theoretically... 99% of theological difficulties have been resolved just by the fact that we are confessional and we have a particular standard. Of course, not every church is confessional and not every church has some kind of a, uh, a written doctrinal standard, which is unfortunate. But Jared, would there be any red flags for you? Like if you saw a certain thing, um, maybe even in a church that might otherwise look kind of good on the outside that you'd be like, I'm not touching this <laughs> with a 10 foot pole. Well, they they're done different levels you know we think of um i think it's in the belgic confession it talks about the marks of the church so if those marks are not there or you're limited on them you can't rightly preach the gospel sacraments um and church discipline then those would be definite red flags but there's there's also some that are just within how does the the church function how does the leadership function 
Um, are there some things that just do not fit your skill set? And so that's part of what these questions were meant to be is some things are red flags and some things are just yellow flags. They're, yeah. okay, this is something to be aware of and to say, do I have the skill set to answer a church that is going through this particular problem or has had this particular pastor in the in its past to deal with the, the ramifications from that? And you may have a skill set that really fits a church that is um, that is hurting in that way and you may not. Um, I, my dad had a saying, I think he borrowed it from Billy Graham, that if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll yeah. ruin it. Right. So in asking any of these questions, hopefully your goal is not to find the perfect church because then if you do, don't pastor it because you'll ruin it. Um, it's to find a, a church that fits your, um, your skill set, your giftings, and uh, to make sure that you're not walking into something that you're not able to, uh, to answer and to control or there's expectations that are put on you that you're not able to meet. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so in just a minute here, we're going to go through that article. Um, and I like kind of the red flag, yellow flag, green flag analogy here, because hopefully as you're beginning to ask yourself these questions reflectively about a possible new call, you're you're looking for green flags, right? But but not every church is going to have all green flags. In fact, none of them are. There's going to be some yellow flags that come up along the way. In fact, if there weren't any yellow flags, then I'm not sure that there'd be much of a challenge there for you. You could probably only do the church wrong if they had everything right the first time. But red flags we might want to treat a little bit more differently or carefully that might indicate that we could be walking into a landmine. And that's why I thought Jared's article was uh, so helpful that we should talk about it today. Again, the article was called 10 Questions Every Candidate Should Ask a PCA Search Committee. Um, the article was dated September 29 of this year, 2022, and posted to PCAPolity.com. So, Jared, without uh, any further ado, let's get into the first question uh, that you you mentioned. The first one you asked has to do with the ordinary means of grace. Can you kind of explain that term and why that might be a good thing to check into? Yeah, and depending on whether you're in a PCA context or another context, that language may not be familiar to everybody. And in fact, some of these questions probably are better asked to leadership in the church rather than a search committee. And so you have to use some discernment if that's not the same group. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's the same group. Sometimes it's different. But with that one in particular, you're looking at uh, really Acts 242. What did the early church devote themselves to? They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. And um, usually that passage has been um, connected with the apostles teaching that we find in the scriptures. Uh, we find the, the fellowship and worship as well as the breaking of bread, the sacraments and uh, the prayers. And so what does the church do? Um, well, it does a lot of things, but it should at least do these things, which would be word, worship with the sacraments and prayer. And so asking the question of what role does the word have, does uh, worship have, and does um, prayer have in the church is important to gauge the health of the church that you're interviewing with. So if you're asking what's central to the church and they start talking about the, the old pastor's personality, mm -hmm. or they start talking about, well, this particular program that we do uh, that reaches out to, um, uh, to those with addictions or something like that, or um, our social gatherings, we have one once a month or once a week or whatever. Um, we, we really, that, that's what's most important to us. And all those things could be good, uh, but are they uh, what should be central? And so if you have a church that isn't committed to prayer, uh, isn't uh, thinks of worship just as a couple of songs before the sermon, uh, or uh, could do without a sermon, hey, you don't have to preach this Sunday, let's do a work thing instead, um, that tells you at least uh, a little bit of the health of the congregation that programs can come and go, pastors can come and go, but uh, for 2000 years, it's been the apostles teaching, yeah. fellowship, breaking of bread, and the prayer. So this is seeing is the central thing, the central thing. And if some of your answers are at variance, you at least have a little bit of work to do to say, what's the central thing that we can't do without? Mm. I actually was talking to a person one time about their church. And the very first thing that they said about it was that they had a mini golf course right on the church property. And I thought to myself, what an interesting thing to lead with. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that for some people that may connect. Uh, hey, cool. Mini golf. That's great. Um, but I'm not sure that that would be the the main thing that the church kind of centers around. What would you say if they said their band? 
Um, would you fault them for that if they said, "Hey, we have a we have a killer band"? I mean, obviously you're you're pretty into music yourself, but is it possible that the perform the performance orientation of a church's worship style might actually be a, a detraction from again what we call the ordinary means of grace? Well, you'd have to ask the question: Why are they saying that, and who's saying it? Is this coming from the leadership and the elders, or is this coming from somebody in the search committee? And they just want to say, we're really proud of this, or this is something that's important to them. You know, maybe they are the lead guitarist on the band and they want to make sure you're not going to change it. Yeah. And you just have to ask some questions to say, well, that may be a really good aspect of the church, or that may be something that you're really into. But what if that wasn't there? Like, a, what's what's the main thing? And is it, uh, what is worship? I think that would be another interesting question to say. Mm, what do you think yeah. is worship? Is it, mm -hmm. is it music? Um, are the prayers or the sermon are you know, taking vows or the sacraments, is that part of the worship too? Or is that something else that takes up time and then you get back to the real thing that is worship? So all of those are a longer conversation to see where they're at and how they understand worship. And maybe some of the early teaching you may need to do if you take that that position and say, hey, let's talk about worship. Let's start in Acts 2.42 and say, what did the early church do? And are yeah. we doing those things? The next thing you brought up uh, may be a little bit uncomfortable for some people because you brought up the the concept of church discipline. Now, I think there's probably part of all of our heart that would think that it would be better if there were no church discipline, because that would mean um, perhaps that there were no issues in the church, no moral scandals, no difficulties. Um, but what would you think if you asked about church discipline and they said, we just don't have that in our congregation, is that a problem or would you take that to be a good thing? Well, that's, that's a good question to ask them is when's the last time there's a discipline case. And again, the, the elders may know that better than the general search committee. Um, but churches tend to fall off the boat on one or the other side and, mm -hmm. With discipline, it's it's sometimes used as a mark of the church, the Belgian confession. Um, and that means that if it's not there, the church isn't being the church. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, we tend to think of discipline as uh, perhaps something harsh or unloving. Uh, there's at least a, an apocryphal story of my grandfather in the Methodist church being asked to be a deacon. And they said the first thing you need, need to do is to read this book. And it was the uh, the book of discipline. That's their, uh, or the rules of discipline was their uh, their book that's kind of like their BCO and confessions. And uh, the story is that he handed it right back, says, I don't think this is for me. Um, mm. The the word discipline had the a bad connotation there. But yeah. in Hebrews, we're told that uh, the Lord chastises or disciplines every son that he has and that he loves, and that our um, fathers did that as seemed best to them. And it was an aspect of love. And so if there's no discipline, then the other question is, do you do you love your people enough to, to discipline them if the need arises? Um, if there's no discipline, they can't remember, um, then um, there's probably some teaching that's going to at least need to be done about the fact that it helps with, you know, it's, it's for the purity of the church. It's yeah. for uh, the honor of Christ. And it's to reclaim a sinner. You have to ask, what if somebody doesn't attend? Uh, do you go after them? Are Do you leave the 99 and go after the one? That's an act of love. And that's what we mean in church discipline. Now they could also answer, well, we've had so many this year, we don't know how to keep count. Yeah. And if there's a, a an overzealous or overactive uh, disciplining, even using discipline in areas that probably just needed to have somebody come alongside and say, let me give you some instruction, uh, then that could be a bad sign too of a, a church that maybe is using it to take care of problem members. You're, you're being too right. loud. I'm going to cut you off when mm -hmm. it's not meant for that. That's not the that's not meant to be a tool that just cut off problems. It's meant to be reclaiming of sinners and for the purity of the church. It's such um, a tenuous moment when a church goes through a disciplinary proceeding, even if it's not known to the whole of the body, because it requires such incredible wisdom on the part of the leadership. You have all kinds of uh, potential ways that it could go wrong in terms of uh, confidentiality, uh, harshness, uh, personal animus can get involved. And so Discipline is one of those markers that, uh, though you don't like to see it commonly, when present, uh, it is an extremely healthy thing. It's, I suppose, somewhat like going to the doctor's office, and though you don't like to hear any kind of negative report about what's happening in your body, 
Yet sometimes direct actions and preventative actions are necessary in order to, to root out the disease or, or to prevent it from getting worse. So if a person said, hey, I never go to the doctor, uh, that's not necessarily indicative of the fact that they have no health issues. Uh, what would be what would be best is that their regular health maintenance and routine is is up to check. And so, um, yeah, that's a that's a great one. I'm glad you brought that up. I wonder how many pastors would have the nerve to ask that to a search committee because it is a fairly direct question. It could almost come across as, as abrasive. Maybe I don't know. Did you ask that question when you were when you were candidating at your current church? I did. And um, they weren't offended by it, maybe because it was a, a PCA church and they know that they should. They have a book of church order that says that they should. Um, although they were pretty honest about, well, probably for lack of attendance was the last sort of you know thing. And mm -hmm. so there wasn't a memory of a lot of uh, action there. Um, mm -hmm. If you're in a, a Napark church, though, and you're candidating there, it's a little bit easier to say, well, we're supposed to be doing this. It's in our book of, uh, of discipline or book of church order. Um, it may be a little bit harder if it's an independent church that doesn't have a history of that. I was um, listening to an OPC pastor once in Texas who um, in their town, they would get together with other like-minded churches, many of them community churches or Baptist churches, and they would always talk about the difficulty of doing discipline because they didn't have yeah. rules for it. And so he just offered, made them copies of the OPC's book of, uh, of mm. discipline and so there's a bunch of churches apparently in a, in Texas that are basically using the OPC's uh, book of discipline. So if, you know, if you're a foreign Baptist and you're going to a church and they don't have, they don't have history with that, you know, take a look at resources like the OPC, the PCA's book of discipline and set up something that has similar rules so that people know how to do it because so often it's not done because we don't know how to do it. Yeah. That is a little intimidating when you look at the PCA book of church order, when you have a major section of the book the constitution is about discipline. Uh, you know, in, in a church book of order, you've got things about um, what a session is and what a congregation does and what, what the offices are. And then you've got maybe a section about worship, what worship should look like. And then there's this huge chunk in the back about discipline. And you're like, oh man, how, do, how often does this happen? <laughs> um, but discipline also brings up the role of the elders in the church. And I want to transition to that next um, so as reformed churches, of course, we have not just pastors and deacons, but we also have what we call ruling elders. In fact, uh, we often use the term pastor to describe a teaching elder. And then we have those ruling elders that also together comprise the leadership of the session. So that's kind of how our church government works. Um, whether or not you call them the board or elders or deacons, I suppose uh, we could quibble about that another day. But what do you think, Jared, is the role of the the elders and the deacons, and how does that figure into uh, discerning whether or not a church is in a state of health? Yeah, that that's why it's an important question to ask: is what does shepherding by the ruling elders look like in this church? Mm -hmm. And that may be a strange question to some. They um, they may think, well, that's the job of the pastor. Uh, after all, pastor actually literally means basically shepherd. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually talk about the ruling elders doing shepherding as well. And um, that may include hospitality, um, home visits of some sort, um, maybe even hospital visits, but knowing the spiritual health of the congregation, uh, talking with them, getting in their lives. Um, and that's healthy when a church has that model. And uh, some others, though, will see the role of either ruling elders or a board that they're like a CEO um, or some sort of a corporate board that they attend meetings and they tell the pastor who's their employee what to do. And um, that's not as healthy because then when you're shepherding the congregation, it's you don't have a team that's helping you. Um, and that's what you want. When you go into a congregation, um, you're going to have to rely on your ruling elders because they've known the people longer. They've grown up with them. They can tell you, um, you know, you really need to take this problem seriously and you need to look after uh, this that's going to come up and this is how to deal with this person that seems contentious, but actually has a heart of gold or whatever it is mm -hmm, that uh, mm -hmm. they can um, to have a ruling elder uh, group that um, knows where the landmines are and knows the congregation is one of the biggest helps to coming in there. So if they they're plugged in and they're shepherding, um, you're, you're going to hit the ground running when you go into the church versus um, if they don't have that, uh, you may need to do a little bit of, of shepherding of the, the session first. 
um, and they may actually have questions. I asked this question, I was candidating in a lot of different uh, churches at one point, and I asked this to one um, group that the, the search committee was the session, and they said, um, we don't, but we'd like to learn. <laughs> so they were very mm. open to saying, mm. we're failing to, to shepherd, but we need to. And yeah. so I thought that was a, a healthy response, even if the if it's it doesn't look like anything, but we're open to being helped in, in our role, that, that could be a good response too. Do you think it's too nervy to ask about the previous pastor, why it is that he's leaving the position? Um, let's even say too, uh, for a, someone who's looking for a youth director job or the church choir director job, or hey, maybe senior associate pastor. Is it is it appropriate to ask what happened to the last guy? I think it's very appropriate because especially if you are going to be the pastor that's coming into that role, you need to know how to shepherd the people and what they've been through. So if the the last pastor in that position left on really great terms, um, then really your job is a little bit easier. You get to celebrate them. Um, but whether they left and retired as a beloved saint or they um, or they passed away in the position, I, I came into a church in which the previous pastor had um, had preached about 10 days before he passed away really? uh, from cancer. And so he was very much still in the position. And part of coming in there was the first thing I was preparing for was how do I shepherd them in their grief and honor wow. his legacy? And so if I didn't know that. Um, I would have been dealing with people that I, I wonder why they're acting the way they are. Well, they haven't yeah. quite processed their grief of the previous guy. But also if you're coming into a position and um, some of this may be the red flag of they've had five pastors in the past three years. Mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm. you're going to have to ask, why did they leave? And um, how am I going to last longer than they are? Um, because um, they may have the similar things going off in their heads of, uh, I've been on the search committee and I've gone through this process a lot and uh, to know, okay, what, why did they leave? Um, yeah. And it could have been out of frustration. It could have been personal failings. They just happened to got, yeah. have pastors that had personal failings that they didn't screen for. Mm -hmm. And even that you're going to have to shepherd the congregation. If, if the the shepherd has hurt the, the flock, you need to be shepherding them and, and healing some of those wounds and gaining trust. And you have to know when you come in, are they going to trust me or, or, do I have a suspicious eye on me right when I come in? Now, when you talked about the pastor that died 10 days prior to his last preaching, was that at your current church or was that the church before this? Or when did that happen? That, that was a current church. That oh, wow. I'm in now. Yeah. Okay. I did not know that. You, you've you been in the Presbytery a little bit longer than me. I consider you my big brother in Ascension Presbytery, even though I'm quite older than you in uh, chronological years, but you, you've got a little bit more history in our Presbytery than I do. I, I followed in after two pastors here that both had about 27 year long tenured pastorates. I mean, you don't hear about that a lot these days. I don't know what the average tenure is, but 27 years twice in a row, that's a pretty long time. And so uh, a little pressure there, a little pressure to hit the three decade mark. <laughs> and I think um, if you're looking for a resource, um, if you've ever heard of Harry Reader's Embers to a Flame, um, there's probably too much um, historical analogies and stories in there. But one good thing that I gleaned from that was um, looking at your past, both to honor it and to see if there's areas you need to repent of that right. you need to repent of not shepherding well uh, with the session or uh, to honor what's come before you. So one thing we did was we um, he was a guy that was known for you'd come into the office. He would talk to you about your problem and he'd hand you a book. And so we renamed the library after him, put a picture in there, and then had just people tell stories about um, their memories of him, what they appreciated. Huh. And then we videoed that and sent it to the family. And so just yeah. some way to honor to say, I'm not here to to forget about all of that, but let's honor yeah. that so we can we can move and, and build on that foundation. Now, speaking of kind of nervy questions, is it acceptable to bring your wife into the conversation? I mean, on one hand, it's uh, it's us who are employed by the church. And so technically the job description responsibilities are ours to discharge faithfully as uh, the, the, the hired, um, the pastor of, of the flock. But is it okay to ask about one's wife, what previous pastor's wives have done uh, in the church, do you think that that's an appropriate question too? Yeah, there's there's all sorts of expectations that are not stated when, um, well, first of all, if you get married, 
that's one of the things you have to figure out is what are our expectations of each other so that we know what we're getting into in marriage. Well, when you come into a, a church, you need to know what those expectations are for you and for your wife. So yeah. asking both the question of what's expected of me. Um, so what does, what does success look like? What is, uh, what do you expect me to do? Or do you, or, you know, your previous pastor, was he in the office all the time and people came in and talked to him or was he out in the community? Mm -hmm. um, but also for the wife, um, you know, the, just the question of what are the expectations of my wife? And um, you may expect to hear, like I did in, in my call, to be your wife and to, and to uh, mother your children, which I said, that's great. That frees her up to volunteer where she wants to volunteer and, and is gifted versus, well, we're getting a two for one deal, right? Um, right. We expect that you're going to be in charge of the Sunday school, or you're going to be the one that leads the choir, or you're going to be the one uh, that is playing the piano because we need an organist too. And so if that's the expectation, even within the interview process, you may need to set expectations of my wife doesn't play the piano. Is that going to be okay for you that she is, she's going to maybe volunteer with the women's to, to do uh, Bible studies or an area she's gifted, but she is not going to be whatever the previous uh, pastor's wife is going to be. And that may be a uh, a deal breaker for them, or it may be something where you just set the expectation before you come in so that your wife doesn't know why people are shooting her looks that she's not doing more. Yeah. You know, I think this is one of those areas where uh, most churches would not state it in so many words, what the expectations are. It would be more like these implicit assumptions that they've gained from track record experience in the past of what the previous person had done. And so they might not have even thought about that question overtly. They just kind of have these um, these kind of built-in, intrinsically assumed presuppositions about the pastor's wife that may or may not be accurate. Uh, there may even be assumptions that the wife needs to have chosen this uh, particular method of education for their children. Let's say she is expected to homeschool or expected to not homeschool or expected to have musical talent or not. And yet um, those things can be, um, they can be pretty, um, they're, they're dangerous in one sense, because um, this is an, like an area where it's, it could go wrong. Things could go wrong. I am very thankful for, for my wife because she is not what I consider a give me the mic wife. Um, I've seen a lot of pastoral relationships where the wife is very vocal, if not outspoken in her leadership in the church, such that some are quite frequently up on the platform and sharing the microphone with the pastor. I've always personally, I'm getting into my opinion here, found that to be quite off-putting myself. And so I've been very thankful that my own wife She's the kind of person that would serve in the nursery or bake meals for people when they're sick. Uh, she likes to make blankets for the new for the new babies, but uh, she would not at all feel comfortable speaking out in a congregational meeting setting or something like that. Um, I think she, that would be very uncomfortable for her. Yeah, and what a blessing when our wives can serve in ways that they're called to, and they feel like it's they're actually volunteering within the church rather than this is on your job description, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, let's jump ahead to a couple more questions here, and I think we'll wrap up in a little bit. But um, what about the pastor and experiencing criticism from the church? Uh, that was a pretty good one you mentioned in your article. Do you want to speak to the idea of how elders perhaps might help field those kinds of criticisms when they're when they're harsh? Yeah, this would this may go along with how they view their role as elders or leaders in the church that what's their role? Is it to just give the pastor feedback or is it also to um, uh, head off some troubles of the past? Um, whether it's criticism that is um, unwarranted or an expectation that they have that the session doesn't, you know, are they willing to say uh, that's, that's not in his job description. That's not why we call them or that's unfair. You haven't seen them in this uh, context, just to know that um, their reflexive uh, attitude would be to uh, have your back if, if it is an unfounded criticism. And if it's founded criticism, uh, finding ways to um, address that with a pastor in a way that is direct and, and helpful to him, rather than to kind of propagate the, the gossip or the rumor mill behind your back. You know, you want to you hear criticisms to your face by somebody that you trust. 
yeah. rather than behind your back. And so uh, for them to be able to filter that through to defend you when you need defending and to bring valid criticisms to you when you need to hear it in the right way um, is very helpful. That's that's going to determine success or failure in your in your ministry in the future. Well, how about this as a wrap up question, Jared, if you're in that interview process and you're kind of at that moment where the conversation has uh, gone this way and that's and you're at the last moment where they say, do you have anything else you want to know about us before you take the position? What would what would you say is your last best question to make sure you've wrung the wash rag out for every drop that you can learn about the church? Is there anything else that you'd say you have to know before you sign that uh, that, uh, that contract or whatever. Well, you could have an evaluative question or you can have, um, kind of a red flag question of, um, just asking them their own self-awareness of what's going to be my biggest challenge yeah. uh, as I enter into this congregation. And, um, they may say something that has to do with the other questions that you asked, you know, the, the last pastor left under scandal and you're gonna have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Or we have all these marriages that are in trouble that you're going to have to teach us how to do discipline and how to shepherd them well. And so that may be helpful to say, this is not necessarily whether or not I'm taking it, but uh, if I say yes, uh, in the next three months while I'm moving down here, what do I need to prepare for so I can hit the ground um, running? And then also just asking them, so that's what's the biggest challenge. And for me, what are you gonna look at down the line and say, uh, I think we made a good decision on calling them. What's success measured by? Um, mm -hmm. is it going to be, we, we expect to be twice as big in two years. Well, if that doesn't happen, but we're, we're growing, you know, in terms of, um, depth of knowledge of the scriptures and of the gospel, and we're in a rural community and there's just not that people there to, to grow that much unless we steal from the church down the street. Um, is it the, what does success actually look like? And so knowing what their expectations are of you, as well as what your challenges are going to be, I think is one of the biggest uh, helps so that your mindset can be set. If I'm taking this call, this is what I'm preparing for. And this is what they expect of me. And I'm, I'm comfortable with that to say, yes, if your expectations are faithfulness or uh, teaching us the word, um, that's, that's something I can sign on to. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Well, again, you can find Jared's entire article on PCAPolity.com. I want to thank you so much for checking in with us today. Uh, Jared, you know, one of the best, um, before we sign off here, one of the best questions I've ever heard somebody ask was, what is the thing that if you don't tell me right now is going to be painfully obvious a year from now? <laughs> I thought that was a, a great way to say, like, hey, full disclosure, what's what's going on in the church? That's a great way to ask it. But uh, yeah. yeah, you definitely want to check out Jared's article. It's a really good article. Very, very helpful. And again, if you're anywhere near Hopewell Township, PA, please check out Jared Nelson at New Life PCA. Hey, give us your so your social medias real quick. So if anyone's out there, they can follow you on Twitter or wherever else you are. Um, I'm on uh, Twitter at uh, Brother Nelson. And uh, that's probably the one that's worth uh, following. It's mostly just if I write an article or have a, a quote or a verse that I want to share. Great. Well, thank you so much. Hey, thanks everybody for checking in. Uh, we will catch you later. Love you lots and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.